Secunda's light fell upon the topal palms, groaning in the windstorm. Flickering shadows passed over he who was below. Thundercracks parted the sky as more brought the wet season overhead, and flashes came upon the fanatical helm of the Remanite, etched with sigils of the esoteric, and painted with the poems of truth unfolding. His blades were oiled with the blood of those who defied him, the wretches that knew not the homilies of the Masserine king, those that were without the will to conquer. Soldiers of Leowen stood about him, calling for his surrender, their mail muddy and rusted, their bodies soft and untested. None but ourselves was uttered from beneath the mask as the Remanite brandished his weapons. All must believe in or belong to me. When dawn came and reinforcements followed, they saw only horror. Sweat clung to their faces as they stood wide-eyed and struggled to hold the contents of their stomach. Before them were eight soldiers, split wetly and bone broken, arranged in diamond shape. The soil of the center was soaked in blood and crowded in flies that feasted on its rot. I present to you the Remanite build. A truly terrifying role-playing experience that draws from the more esoteric, weird, and apocryphal lore that surrounds the dynasty of the Reman Emperors. He is a fanatic devoted to the pursuit of violence that is the reality implicit in all creation, as he seeks mastery over his inner world through self-mortification and wanton indulgence, and his outer world through raw domination of his environment. He follows everything to its end point. Go all the way. Reach heaven by violence. But now I have some real esoteric knowledge to drop on you. It's about today's sponsor, a game all about building the best team of champions you can to strategically conquer any foe. The game has over 800 champions to unlock, each belonging to a unique faction, and there's new updates coming out all the time. Of course, this is Raid Shadow Legends, an RPG you can download on mobile and PC. The game features many modes to master, including a campaign, a PvP arena, and clan bosses. There's also a dungeon mode full of deadly bosses to test different teams of champions against, which is my favorite aspect of the game. And for a limited time, you can participate in the Spring Hunt minigame to have a chance at winning huge real-world prizes. There's skill tomes and legendary champions to get in-game, and the chance to win a free gaming console and Amazon gift cards with a total value of $10,000. All you need to do is download Raid using our link in the description and head to springhunt.plarium.com. Enter your Raid ID and start searching for missing items. Raid is also celebrating their players with their Community Weeks event, where everyone can get a free legendary champion Chronicler Adolin. She's a top tier support who can put an enemy to sleep without even hitting them, even if an enemy has block debuffs. To get Adolin, just log in for 7 days anytime between April 11th and July 8th. There's actually 14 days of rewards in total. So what are you waiting for? Click our link in the description or scan the QR code on screen and you'll get a huge starter pack with an epic champion, Tayrell, from the High Elves faction. And at level 25, you'll get another starter pack that includes a strong support epic champion, Rector Drath. Once you're in, you can also use the promo code SPRINGHUNT24 to get silver and more, and you'll probably want to join a clan. You'll need your friends' usernames, and you can find mine as FudgeKiller, so just hit my link in the description, and I'll see you on the battlefield. So with that all said and done, I would usually jump into the backstory straight away. However, for this very special build, I feel as if a lore introduction is necessary. Last year I made an apocryphal piece, a sexy way to say fanfiction, about the birth and rise of Reman Cyrodiil, founder of the Second Empire. I was very inspired by Arthurian legend and the weirder lore that surrounds Reman, including some things written by Michael Kirkbride and the Temple Zero Society, as well as inspirations taken from the project Project Tamriel Cyrodiil mod, which aims to bring the province of Cyrodiil into the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, and so its lore is more in line with the original jungled Thousand Colts depiction of Cyrodiil, which is my preference personally. However, this is a Skyrim build, so I'll try to marry the two concepts of lore somewhat. Consider also that just because a character believes these things about Riemann does not mean they are explicitly true. He is part of a cult after all, but we'll get to that. But to better clarify this role-playing build's character, I will be building off this Reman story of my own making. This tale covers the mythical birth of Reman from King Hroll and Ahilak, aka Alicia, the spirit of the land herself, his rise to king and emperor, as well as the story of his knights, his followers who were in this story called the Remanites. 
Though this story does not tell all about the Riemann dynasty that follows, the idea here is that after the death of Riemann I, cults would emerge venerating him as the worldly god as well as his successors, and they would call themselves Remenites in homage of his original followers. They pursue likeness to the Riemann emperors through feats of conquest and greatness. Violence is seen as an implicit reality of creation by the Remenites, and it is seen as the epitome of ascension. There is a particular component of this build that really seals the deal for me and urged me to make this, and that is the Riverwatch armor set by Pool Charm Solus. Pool Charm Solus does incredible work, crafting diverse, lore-based armor sets that do not shy away from the stranger elements of the lore, and this is one such design. The Riverwatch set is made from the scales of the giant newts that inhabit the rainforests of Nibine, not unlike the Imperial Newt Scale armor found in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, and it incorporates silks, painted murals, and beads of jade and other precious gems. And there are two variations of the helmet, but it is this one in particular that I chose for its terrifying visage, tribal feel, and perfect symbolism. The face, like Cyrodiil, is split in two, east and west, Nibine and Clovia, soul and body. Like Riemann, the Kim El Adabal, the crowning gem of the Amulet of Kings, is placed firmly in the center of the forehead, like Riemann when he was born. Beneath the right eye of the mask is the quote, for it is through violence I reach heaven, encapsulating his philosophy of enlightenment through violent pursuits. The crest of the helm reads, Imperium est lex, which means empire is law, and beneath it, lex est sacra, which means law is sacred. And one of the most bizarre quotes to those uninitiated into the Stranger Law and other modding projects is, Great Masserine King, I ask not for the life of ease, I ask for the will to conquer. Again, this is Riemann cult philosophy, however, Masserine King? Well, this is a reference to Riemann, let me explain. There was an out-of-canon source called the Pocket Guide to the Empire 2nd Edition, which was a lore project that set out to embrace the weirdness of the Elder Scrolls universe. It wasn't finished, but it was worked on by several people, including Michael Kirkbride. Again, I'm not claiming this to be canon, but this is part of the beliefs of our character here, so I think it might be best if I just read the source to you. Imperial subjugation of the Lunar Territories began as early as Riemann I. His failed conquest of the Underworld and its terrestrial consequences ended in the loss of his midwife wives and the only anodyne to his grief was a reckless void-eyed hubris. In 1E2757, he circumvented the bureaucracy of his own throne, including all county courtships and trans-provincial authorities to make plans to colonize Tamriel's twin moons. He commissioned the Nacronax of the Immaterial Harmonics Institute of Incogruitech and Extrinsic Travels to begin work on the first gene-engineered megalomoth vessel fortresses to reclaim all extramundic holdings and grant lands from the maddening nighttime tatters of Shazam proof of man's provenance. When Riemann's efforts were finally revealed, there was a large discomfort throughout his sovereignties, and even outright dissent in the Elder Council. These iconoclasts feared Daedric vexation for unritualized trespass into the void, and perhaps rightly so. However, this was all quickly dissolved when the 16 plus princes of Tumult lent their Nimic oaths in their first display of coalition since the fall of Lig in the previous Kalpa. Conjecture points to some machinations of Nocturnal, who took on her mantle of Erdra of Oblivion, and it was by her primogeniture that Riemann was able to pursue his cosmic acquisitions without further censure. Alas, the Cyrodiil did not live to see the completion of the Megalomoth Vessel Fortress, which he wanted to christen as the NVN Many Wife with Interest. Ashbitter Knives of the Dunmeri Assassin's Guild, the Morag Tong, ended him in year 2762 of the First Era. Its final construction and its first landing on Secunda was overseen by his son, Reem II, who renamed it either capriciously, or just more simply, the NVN Accruel. Obviously, that's kind of whack, and it doesn't exactly line up with the current canon orthodox law. For example, Riemann II was the grandson of Riemann I through Castav, not his son. But interestingly, there are canon mentions of Altmeri sunbirds and Imperial Mananauts who took expeditions towards Aetherius, so more or less there is a canon precedent for space travel. There was also a Skyrim mod that was never finished that had the help of Michael Kirkbride called the Secunda Project, but building on all these crazy 
Crazy Moon Province Ideas is an Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind modding project called Gallimorphy, which embraces and creates some really cool ideas. The Remanites in it have a tribalistic faith that preaches and pursues emulation of Remen's personal struggles and triumphs, seeking personal fulfillment through physical and mental perfection, along with some of the weirder bits behind closed doors. So Remen as King of Massa, aka the Masserine King, might make more sense to you now. Anyways, without going into some prolonged diatribe about modding projects and their lore, I just wanted to state the inspirations behind this this build's character, and I think the armor goes brilliantly with it. I will list a whole bunch of lore resources, or in some cases, out of canon lore sources, that all amalgamate to the inspirations behind the heart and soul of this build. But without further ado, let's get into the backstory of the Remanite. In the wake of the Great War, there was a child, not unlike others of his day, a wretch sired upon a scullery maid and rendered fatherless by violence. He was named Illyrius Hatana, born year 173 of the Fourth Era, in a village along the shores of the Silverfish River, deep in the Nibene. His mother, still young, with wet brown eyes held wide in desperation, had fallen into the grasp of a tenpenny tyrant, an odious thug who ran the Imperial Bridge Inn at which she worked. Love was what she called it, yet even her son could see this was not so. Like a devout of Baal, she was loyal to him despite the abuses and three children she gave him in the years following. Illyrius soon became an inconvenience, a leech to which his stepfather was not attached. By age of broom holding, he was made to earn his keep, sweeping stables and scrubbing floors, and even for his mother, he became loathsome for the wedge that he was between she and the father of her new children. By the age of 12, Illyrius had succumbed to the physical abuses of his stepfather and became the unwilling subject of all his vices, sins to which his mother was willfully ignorant. For two more years, he endured evil before chance would present him an escape. The year was 187 of the Fourth Era, and the vastness of the Nibine had become a mire of violence, where the lines between mercenary and bandit were razor thin. It was a quiet morning of misting rain at the Imperial Bridge Inn, and the warm wet breeze brought with it a travelling troop, or at least that is what Illyrius first thought, for they were decked in pearls and jewels of jade, draped in silk, and laid in newt scale armour painted with the traditions of ye old Nibinu. Their masks were unsettling, savage and inhuman, symbols of an older time, of jungles and elves and monkey prophets. Illyrius skulked about them as he went to stable their horses. The band had all dismounted and were moving into the inn. Their leader removed his mask and stood before the boy. Look at me in the eyes, he said as he grabbed him by the chin. Ah, I see Balefire. She said there could be prospects. The stranger let go of his chin and handed him the reins of his horse. Stable her for me. He then held out a septum between his fingers and placed it in the open hand of the boy. Fortune favors those who come to meet it. He winked, and then the stranger turned to follow his men into the tavern, and Illyrius pondered the man's face, immensely scarred and with a crooked nose, and framed by the grey-black slicks of hair. He watched him walk into the tavern as he stabled their horses quickly, for he was eager to follow. The seven strangers sat in the corner, cramming flaking bread and soup into their gullets, and the rest of the patrons were unnerved. Illyrius was called to serve new meals, and for his delays, he was brush-slapped across the back of his head by his stepfather. The scarred stranger of before watched the trembling hands of Illyrius, sloshing soup as he carried bowls to them, as he placed them, and was about to leave. The stranger grabbed his wrist and looked at him in the eye. Heavenly are the suffering, for they are shaved into sharper blades. Do you will him to die? He gestured with his eyes to his stepfather, that lumbering man of rounded belly and oak-like arms. The stranger saw an answer in his eyes. He nodded and slowly let go of the boy's wrist. He stood calmly and walked to the owner. Sit down, sir, I can bring you- Like lightning, there was snapped motion, followed by the emerging wails of horror that echoed from patrons. Screams muffled the gurgling throat sounds of his stepfather, knife neck lodged and wrought free with blood spray. The scarred one pounced atop him, boot pulverizing face to stone floor. Illyrius cradled in the corner as these bandits went wild, trashing the place and stealing what they would. The scarred stranger that led them crouched to the boy. You shiver at its majesty, but violence 
is the path to heaven. The excess clay must be cut away, the weeds wrenched from the garden, the iniquitous parted from the pure. He placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. This was your will, and you tremble at its happening. Do not be afraid. I am here as a prophet, and I say to ye, forget your name. Carve a new one into the flesh of time, a wound made with a will so strong that it leaves a scar. We are the Remenites. Shall you join us? That fateful day the boy left with them, leaving his old name to burn in the house of cinders that was left in their wake. The Remenites returned to their headquarters at Fort Facian before the Vallis Mountains, and here the boy took on a new name, Lux, which means light. Thirteen in total were the Remenite warriors, five were their servants, four were their priestesses led by the Horospex. From the guts of man and animal, she would divine signs of the heavens and advise Volnus, their leader. Volnus was the very same scarred warrior who released the boy from a life of insignificance. He instructed Lux in their history, their legacy and origin, the causes of their now dwindling numbers, and the divine primacy of Riemann from which their philosophy comes. Most would have called them a mere cult to Riemann, but there was a stark difference in them. The Remenites sought to emulate the life of Riemann, to live his philosophy, rather than only profess worship at his feet. To the Remenites, the Riemann king showed the power of the will, a strength that could change the world and rearrange the heavens. It is through violence, the enforcement of one's will on the world, that enlightenment can be attained. For only a short while were they at Fort Facian, for they had business in Breville. The Count was hiring mercenaries of all kinds in desperation, seeking some anodyne to the emerging gang problems. The skooma traffickers were out of control, the streets dominated by their strife, and it so happened that the Remenites, who functioned as mercenaries, were given a job. The soil-slicked streets of Breville were where Lux would learn the ropes. His first kills were made in the alleys, cleaning up gutter rats, dealers and addicts alike. He learnt the arts of torture, snapping fingers and flaying skin, pursuing the tough war on crime that the guard had not the stomach to commit. After a year, no matter the drastic interventions of the Count and his hired mercenaries, the city erupted into violence between the two major gangs, and as for the Remenites, they had extracted all they willed from the Count's coffers, and it was time to move on. Breville was the chrysalis of Lux, and he emerged from it a moth drawn to all flames. The Remenites plied their trade throughout all the Nibine, from Chaden Hall to Leowen, carving their own path. When there was plunder to be had, they were bandits. When there were monsters, they were hunters. When there were the rich yet meek, they were open-handed mercenaries. Theirs was the path of violence, for its scars made sharper edges, made of them better blades to pierce the heavens. Days of ecstatic rituals, hedonic orgies, and violence gained opulence were followed by days of mortification and self-flagellation, for it is at the edges of experience where true wisdom is found. A heresy without possessing the intimacy of dogma is without potency, for you know not what you swing your sword at. The Remenites were addicted to an oscillation of polarities, like the two halves of Cyrodiil, the body and soul, indulging and abstaining from both in cycles, scarring within themselves symbols of ascension. For ten years, Lux had honed himself into a true Remenite. His armor was of newt scale, painted in poetry and adorned in symbolism, his accolades of both heroism and horror. Though in this time order was returning to Cyrodiil, its strength regained, the wilderness of its fringes was slowly tamed. Year 195 of the Fourth Era, the Count of Chaden Hall had charged the Remenites with various crimes and sent his soldiers to retake Fort Facian. Lux's mentor, Volnus, fought to a bloody end, but before his final breath, he bestowed his mask upon Lux and urged him to carry on the Remenites. Lux, with three survivors, managed to escape deep into the south, into the region of Blackwood, and here they wandered and camps, surviving as bandits before eventually making their way to Leowen. Of their group was Lux, the Horospex, a servant named Priam, and a Remenite named Colus. And they managed to blend within the slums of Leowen for some time, plying their trade as mercenaries and offering other services. By year 200 of the Fourth Era, they were still operating out of Leowen, struggling to operate as mercenaries outside of the Fighters Guild's purview, forcing them to take work from less palatable elements of society. 
The horror specs had taken to Lux, loving him of a night and swirling his head with prophetic tales of grandeur. She told him that he must leave here and go far to the north and fulfill his destiny, for there is a balefire within him that burns with the blood of Remen. She spoke in writhing tongues of cryptic prophecy, and Lux with eager lips drank in every drop of it. Their servant Priam told Colas of what he had heard and seen, and he became jealous for he was once her favorite Remanite. Colas conspired with Priam and committed a series of murders to frame Lux, and most gruesomely he invoked the dark ways of Baal, defiling and killing the horror specs, for in his eyes she was the harlot which had abandoned him, and he had been enraptured by an obsession of an evil kind. Above her corpse he stood, awaiting the return of Lux, and when he did, Colas smiled and said to him, Show me now what does not belong to me. They stood quiet for a few moments, understanding what had and what was about to happen. In that upstairs room, a melody of blades sung above the thunderous crashes of furniture and war cries, and only Lux left that room drenched in blood. As he burst into the streets, Priam was coming with the guards. There! That is him! Lux sprinted in the other direction, and, well, if you remember the introduction to this video, you know what happens next. Lux the Remanite survived Laoan's soldiers and ventured far to the north, following signs of the heavens and the forms of comets and stars, relying on intuitions and faith alone. Through the Jural Mountains he trudged and over into Skyrim, yet his life was about to be transformed once more. Another chance happening? Or was it always fate? He got caught between a battle of Stormcloaks and Imperials and found himself chained and on the back of a wagon set for Helgen. That is the backstory for the Remanite, and as you can tell, he is a complex figure with a past of both heroics and horror. He inhabits the middle grey of a moral polarity, not by always aligning with some compromise middle choice. Compromise is, in fact, anathema to him. Rather, there are days for almsgiving and heroics, for mercy and for mortification, whereas there are days for massacres and ritual bloodletting, for stealing and for hedonic indulgence. Polarity encapsulates the Remanite's philosophy. Like a stretching rubber band, he pushes at the extremes of good and evil, of pain and pleasure, of generosity and avarice, of lust and abstinence, of dogma and heresy. Ultimately becoming a more flexible and dynamic being that can gleam the maximum wealth of experience and wisdom. For the Remanite to inhabit both sides of polarity is the path to ascension. Each end greater defines the other. The dogma defines the heretic, and to know both intimately is to hone your right hand and your left. Show me what does not believe in or belong to me is a quote by the Reman King recorded in the Shonietta, and it is more or less the tagline for the Remanites. Will is the core concept of the Remanite, and to better understand his core, the writings of Alistair Crowley and his concepts of love under will would be applicable. Concepts like, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, and love is the law, love under will. The true will of an individual is perfect, in the sense that it is a true calling of the soul, a destiny of sorts, but not defined by reason or artificial desire. It is a love performed in the most present and intuitive sense, from something as simple as, I love this park, I want to walk in it, or I love this person, I want to be with them, or even I love that throne, I want it. Don't get me wrong, this is not a one-to-one -one version of Crowley's Thelema. It is merely borrowing some philosophical principles which are then married with the idea of experiential polarity, resulting in an assimilation of greater experience and hence cutting the Remanite into better shapes. Cutting into better shapes is one of my favoured analogies to describe him because it is inherently violent, the destruction of oneself that is implicit in the creation of a new self. He is both the sculptor and the clay. The fat must be carved down to the most lean and potent flesh of muscle and sinew. Dualistic, Nietzschean, Epicurean, Thelemite, these are some buzzwords which might help understanding. 
But hopefully you have a firm idea of the Remonite's mind, and the great thing about the character from a role-playing perspective is that it allows for lots of flexibility given that both morally reprehensible and virtuous acts can be made depending on your own feelings towards the individuals, gods, organizations, etc. For example, while Sneak is not part of this character's skill set as such, if it is something you wanted to add or boost through enchanting, you could take part in the Dark Brotherhood or the Thieves Guild, it's potentially justifiable to the Remonite, if not for the experience alone. The same can be said in the serving of Daedric Princes. All the different Daedric Princes represent aspects of the mortal experience in some capacity, and hence there is perhaps value to be found there, in either enduring them, overcoming them, or perhaps serving them. The choice shall be yours. In particular, for this Remonite character that I've made here, I have chosen to make him a devotee of Sanguine, seeking out the pleasures contained within a material existence in order to ascend the spirit and give significance to the ascetic periods in between. Also, in the deep lore pseudo-canon stuff about Remon, there is included a bit about his indulgences of hedonism. The Imperial Census of Daedra Lords, written by Michael Kirkbride, is a cut section of the Third Pocket Guide to the Empire, which says this. Sanguine, Prince of Hedonism, Lord over no less than ten times ten thousand pleasure pockets of the void. As revelry and drunken stupor fall under this prince's influence, he has been a favourite of many emperors since the first foundation. Records even indicate that he resided in White Gold Tower during the reign of Remen Cyrodiil, and helped in the somewhat dubious draftsmanship of the Crandali festivals, whose vulgarites did little to help Imperial expansion into Alinor and the other Somersets. The idea that Sanguine himself was present at the court of Remen, and when you look at the Shonietta excerpts and his relations with his midwife wives and his spontaneous ejaculations, then you can imagine that a Remenite philosophy of life may be of an extreme Epicurean nature, and that blends quite nicely with the ideals of the Daedric Prince of the Hedonic Pursuits. I will talk in depth about the gameplay functions of Sanguine Worship with the Winter Sun mod in the stats section, however thematically I think it makes a very good fit. Alternatively, from a roleplaying consideration only, with no regard for Winter Sun's statistical synergies, Worship of Debella could make for a good choice, as Raymond's mother wives Sedyena and Shoniette were both practitioners of the Belly Magics and Vestals of Debella. Saint Alicia could also be fitting, for as described in the Remini Raymond is born of King Hrol and the Hillock, aka the land itself, which is synonymous with Alessia. So in some ways, she is his mother. Overall, there are several deities that you could pick as long as you can justify them through the lens of true will and bettering yourself by grinding against the polarities of experience. The whole power of will as a concept also blends in very nicely with some thematic vibes I just wanted for the character in terms of gameplay. Everyone has seen Dune 2 recently, and the concept of the voice is really cool. The idea of psychically dominating reality by making your will known, aka through speech. Fun fact for you, the Thum as a concept was directly inspired by Dune. What if Vikings do the David Lynch Dune thing? Older Morrowind era lore about the Thorn was also less defined as a language and not associated with dragons, more like a mysterious power of will vibe to it. Similar to Dune, but that aside, I think dragon shouts make a really cool fit for the Remonite character, and literally shouting his will into existence is thematically on point, so expanding your dragonborn powers will be of key importance. Speaking of which, your dragonborn status is of course the destiny of the north that the Horospex was alluding to, and the Remonite will embrace it fully, dominating dragons and eventually even growing strong enough to enforce his will upon Alduin. The bend will shout is also going to be a central choice, but I'll speak more on that later. As for factions and quest lines, I would highly recommend Pursuit of All Experience. Hence, Thieves Guild and Dark Brotherhood, as I said before, are options in spite of his skill set, and with the power of the voice, plus alchemy and enchanting, the College of Winterhold is another option. The companions are a more perfect fit, being a warrior culture of mercenaries, and I would probably also say that the Empire is the side to go with during the Civil War questline. His very helm says the Empire is law and that the law is sacred, implying that the Empire is sacred, and the way I choose to interpret this through a Remonite lens is that the Empire as an entity we know today, that is the Tamriel spanning empire with ruby ranks, was formed with the rise of Remen. It is a result of the will of Remen, and all else after is spiritual succession. Lux, the Remonite, fully believes in the tales of the Arcturian heresy, believing Talos not to be divined by apotheosis and a chosen of the gods for his deeds, 
But instead, he believes that Tiber Septum became a god via manipulation of the Numidium and with Zurin Arctus and Yzmir Wulfarth. Either way, Ramonite philosophy does not decry him for this, rather they applaud Tiber Septum for such an enforcement of will on the universe, and to some lesser degree, he can respect the Mede dynasty for asserting and taking control of the Empire, and ultimately he would side with them against the Stormcloaks, I think. As for the Dawnguard DLC, I would side against the vampires. I am of the mind of not becoming a corrupted abomination of a Daedra, so no vampire and I would cure your lycanthropy if gained. Reason being that the Remanite quest is to achieve a connection with your true will and to hone both body and soul into better shapes so that you may reach heaven by violence. I think handing over your soul to Merlag Bell or her scene is somewhat antithetical to this. I think now that you should have a very good idea of the character's philosophy and motivations as described through the backstory and roleplaying sections. Now it's time to get into the more statistical nitty gritty and explain the gameplay aspects. The mods we use for our gameplay overhauls are from Anation, the minimalistic varieties which are our preference. They are the Morningstar Races mod, Evenstar Standing Stone mod, Vokri Perk overhaul, and of course, we always add the Winter Sun Faith of Skyrim mod. With that in mind, for our race we are choosing an Imperial, of course, which comes with a very nice initial bonus of two additional perk points to start with and the ability Quick Learner which allows us to learn all skills 8% faster. As for the Standing Stone, I would actually recommend the Lover Stone for the main chunk of your playthrough as you level your skills as it offers 15% faster skill gain for all skills. And combined with the Imperial race ability innate to them, this results in a 23% boost to skill leveling pace which makes a huge huge difference over the course of a playthrough. The Lordstone is a safe and solid choice as well with 75 points added to your armor and then an additional 25% magic resistance, but this is probably more sensical in the later game. As for the Gods of Worship, I mentioned earlier how Sanguine will be the choice, but I explained that there are many others who work from a role-playing perspective. However, the statistical considerations have been given to Sanguine's Worship. His Shrine Blessing fortifies potions by 15%, and as his follower, Health, Magicka, and Stamina regenerate 50% faster while a food item, potion, or ingredient is active, which for our build, given the alchemy perks we choose, will be basically always. The devotee ability isn't something I bother to use, but it allows you to pray in combat, forcing the five nearest hostile people to dance for 20 seconds, costing 10% favor. To gain Sanguine's favor, make mischief, and commit misdemeanors and crimes worthy of a bounty. Indulge in mead, wine, and ale. Find your way out of jail. Easy enough. Now as we level up, we are going to want a lot of stamina to best maximize our damage output. This is a high DPS build focused on dancing a rhythm of slaughter through crowds quickly. I would recommend an even split of health and stamina investment, alternating each level, but once health reaches about 300, I think the rest is best spent in stamina, further increasing your total pool, which has greater regen and restoration capabilities, and your one-handed power attacks, which you do constantly, will do more damage because of the perk Furious Strength. It gives 0.1% more damage per point of stamina, so 300 stamina equals 30% more damage for power attacks, 500 stamina, 50% more damage for power attacks, and so on. And there are plenty of neat synergies here. Also, we will have both absorb health and absorb stamina enchantments on our axes, so we shall have plenty of health recovery options, including potions we make. So if you were to consider any changes, I would, if you're up for it, even go harder on the stamina investment, perhaps bailing on health investment once you hit about 200 and then go all in on stamina. It kind of just depends on how skilled you are, so you might just want to feel that out. Okay, time to jump into skills and perks. The Remanite skills are the following. Enchanting, smithing, one-handed, light armor, speech, and alchemy. There is a ton of crafting ability in this character, and via dragon shouts and the use of scrolls, we have magical abilities to supplement without the investment of magicka and magical school skills. I'm also going to show on screen all of the perks for each of the skills, many of which are self-explanatory, but I will highlight and explain the important ones as I go. First up, there is enchanting. We get enchanting mastery, soul squeezer, soul siphon, thunderstruck, which makes weapon enchantments when delivered by power attacks 50% stronger, synergizing with our high stamina constant power attack playstyle. We also get armor enchanter, regalia enchanter, weapon enchanter, soul enchanter, extra effect, Scroll Sage, 3 out of 3, which at 3 ranks gives us 200% improved scroll effectiveness, and I think scrolls are hardly ever used typically in Skyrim, and I think this was a cool addition to the build to provide some extra utility, plus it gives him access to some arcane abilities outside of the Thumb. We also get Scroll Hunter. 
For smithing, it's very simple. We get basic smithing, dwarven smithing, advanced heavy smithing, ebony smithing, elven smithing, advanced light smithing, and arcane blacksmith. For one-handed, we get one-handed mastery, dual flurry two of two, dual savagery, blade dancer, disciplined fighter, furious strength, valorous charge, crater maker, disarming slash, grievous wounds one of two, shield biter, which makes power attacks with war axes smash through shields, giving a critical strike for six times crit damage and forcing them to drop their shield. And then we finally get victory rush which gives us 100 points of stamina on kill, an invaluable perk for this high stamina exertion playstyle. For the light armor perks, we get light armor mastery, light armor fit, light armor training, matching light set, tough hide, agility, wind runner, which gives us a flat 10% boost to movement speed, which is important for us in dodging since we have no blocking because we're dual wielding. War dancer makes our attacks deal 20% more damage and critical damage in all light armor, though taking an unblocked hit disables this effect for 10 seconds. And Untouchable gives us 15% more movement speed in all light armor, but though again, it's disabled for 10 seconds if you take a hit. For speech, we have speech mastery, tonal harmony, words of power two out of two, giving 50% more powerful shouts, scold, which makes it so power attacks reduce remaining shout cooldown by five seconds, which is really handy since we power attack constantly, which is also great just giving us a 25% chance to finish a shout cooldown immediately. And last up, we have alchemy. Alchemy mastery, benefactor, slow metabolism two out of two, which causes our potion and food effects to last three times as long, which is fantastic because of the other boosts they give and the other synergies we have for this build. We also get Experimenter, Green Thumb, and Stimulants, which makes it so there is a 2% regen of total magicka and stamina per second while under the effects of potion or food. Hence, slow metabolism helps here by extending that period. Adrenaline is a beast perk, allowing us to move 10% faster under effects of beneficial food or potion. And when this is stacked with the light armor boosts, provided we haven't taken an unblocked hit, we should be getting a total of 35% faster in movement while under the effect of a potion or food food and wearing all light armor, so we are a very speedy guy. And finally, we just round this out with purity and double toil and trouble. Okay, so that's all the skills and perks for the Remanite. Let's get the guy dressed, outlining his equipment and weapons and powers and so on. And then afterwards, we can see how this all gets wrapped up in a playstyle. As I mentioned before, the armor this character wears is the beautiful lore drenched Riverwatch armor set, a mod made by Pool Charm Solus. The Riverwatch armor set will be enchanted with a boost to stamina as well as stamina regen, further stacking our power attack potential. The Riverwatch gauntlets will be enchanted with a boost to one handed and alchemy. The Riverwatch helmet will be enchanted with a boost to alchemy and water breathing, because why not? And the Riverwatch shin guards will be enchanted with more one handed damage and another stamina boost. For jewelry, I took a gold diamond ring and a gold diamond necklace and enchanted these as the Masserine soul, a ring, and the Masserine heart a necklace. Both of these pieces are enchanted with a boost to one-handed damage and magic resistance, which will help round out the defensive capabilities of this build. Plus, the worst thing for this build would be ice mages with ice spells that A, slow you down, and B, drain your stamina. It's just god-awful. So, it's important to have some magic resistance to counter this eventuality. The weapons of the Remanite are two Madness War Axes. I think they look sick and... Well, this build is a little insane. He names one each after the midwives and lovers of Riemann, Sedienna and Shoniette. His axe, Sedienna, is enchanted to absorb stamina and cause fire damage, for she made the hard climb to the top of the hill at Senkator and revealed the light of man to the crowds. And his other axe, Shoniette, absorbs health and soul traps. For practical purposes, I would also acquire and carry with you the Black Star, allowing you to frequently and with ease recharge your weapons. Also, just a note, when enchanting with a Soul Trap enchantment, I always put its duration right down so it gets more charges, because one second is usually enough. The Soul Trap essentially occurs on the kill strike only. That's just my preference. But now for food and alchemy. There are various alcohols that you could indulge in for the sake of sanguine, but for non-roleplaying use, I would look for things that are without the inhibiting effects on stamina regeneration. Mind you, with the enchanted axes plus other potions and foods, the negative effects can be largely negated, but still. Things like Mazda is good because it damages Magicka regen, which we don't even use, and increases frost resistance by 20% and restores stamina. For food, there is a great variety of options, but for reliable choices, I would suggest 
breakfast, crab stew, and vegetable soup. Vegetable soup requires a cabbage, a potato, a leek, and a tomato, and it restores one point of health and one point of stamina per second for 720 seconds. But with our alchemy perk, slow metabolism, this becomes 2160 seconds, aka 36 minutes. So it keeps our other alchemy perk, adrenaline, active, which boosts our speed by 10% when under the effects of food or potion. So with this very simple to make food, we get a baseline one point stamina and health regen per second, providing a nice baseline of regeneration and 10% movement speed. Very worthwhile in my opinion. The crab stew is basically the same, requiring only garlic and crab meat instead of the tomato and cabbage, and it restores two stamina points per second instead of one. For potions, I have two custom ones that I relied on. The first being a simple health potion that fortifies health and restores health, and all it requires is a blue mountain flower and wheat, which is easy enough to get a hold of. However, the main appeal potion is one that restores 122 stamina and 122 health and cures all disease with all of the alchemy perks and enchantments and stuff that this character has in the end game. This is basically my elixir of life that is made with a charred skeever hide, eye of the saber cat, and hawk feathers. Just a great handy selection to have on hand. This character has no spells, which he uses per se, however he is a great user of the Thorm, which reveals a great host of abilities which he can use. As I may have mentioned in the past, I'm a fan of Morrowind Era lore where the Thorm was more of a sort of enforcement of will upon reality. Less defined spell words, more like the power of the voice in Dune, by which it was inspired anyway. Keeping in line with this vibe, I very much wanted to make the focus on chats simple and reliable, and on themes, so unrelenting force, aka just the raw power of your voice, knocking people down to the ground is really cool for this build. Also, the Bend Will Shout that can be acquired in the Dragonborn DLC almost certainly has this effect, dominating people and dragons with the very will of your words. Show me now what does not belong to or believe in me. For that Super Saiyan charged up Dragonborn effect, I also think Dragon Aspect just looks godly and has many practical benefits and Fire Breath and Storm Call are also just both awesome. But to fill the gaps, there are also scrolls, which give the Remanite access to a host of arcane abilities which he does not have by his nature, hence allowing him to ascend through the College of Winterhold if he so wills it. Okay, so now you will have absorbed everything about this character's stats. It is now time to explain more clearly how this culminates in a playstyle. While there are many exhaustive buffs and bonuses between perks and enchantments and food and potions of powers, the synergies created are still rather simple in application. The actual gameplay is like that of a high DPS dual wielding berserker, relying on speed and dodging and then unleashing a flurry of power attacks. A playstyle which is greatly supported by shouts, especially unrelenting force, because because even a single word can provide just enough stagger to create a window of opportunity so that you can unleash a dual power attack straight to their dome without being hit, therefore not losing your additional damage and speed buffs from the light armor perks. It will be important to remember to consume vegetable soup or crab stew before battles so that the effects of stimulants and adrenaline allow you to access that regen and also move faster. More speed is good. Plus that food just provides a baseline of regeneration for health and stamina that is only topped up by the weapon enchantments of absorb health and absorb stamina and on top of that you have the perk victory rush that will be getting you 100 stamina back on every kill and you also have potions to recover health rapidly if needed functionally this is a powerful build suitable for high levels such as legendary if that is your thing that I think is all of the information that you require to fully understand and play the Remanite build. I really enjoyed the creation of this character and I would urge you to check out the Reman story I wrote last year, linked below, as its narrative immerses you in the essence of Reman. Plus, I'm just really proud of that story and thank everyone who watches. Also, I have linked below several canon and less canon resources for some reading to help inspire your Remanite playthrough. I also want to thank Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Click the link below or scan the QR code on screen to gain all the benefits I spoke about at the start of the video. Thanks so much for watching, guys. It's so crazy to us that we've been making Skyrim builds for over 10 years now, and who knew Elder Scrolls 6 was going to be so far away? I hope you guys enjoy. Give the video a like and comment below. All the algorithm boosting stuff that helps us out. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.